Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Pathways to Success, Connecting Learning to College and Careers. We appreciate your taking the time to participate in the webinar today, and we also appreciate the sponsors of today's webinar, Pivot Learning and the Linked Learning Alliance. Before we begin, I'll review just a few quick housekeeping items. We definitely welcome your questions and encourage you to send them in at any time during the webinar. We'll answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A period at the end. To send a question, just use the questions feature in your control panel. You can type your question into the top box and then click send. I'll receive your question and I'll put that into the queue to be answered at the end of the webinar. If you have any tough technical difficulties during the presentation, you can use that same questions feature to get my attention and I'll do my best to resolve the problem for you. The number one problem that people run into is a disruption in audio and that can happen because your internet bandwidth may slow down from time to time um, and sometimes firewalls and um, things like that within schools can also cause a problem with the audio. So if you are having audio trouble, um, you might want to try to disconnect from the computer audio and use the phone to dial in. You can keep the, the um, computer up to see the slides, but um, sometimes the phone audio is a little more um, reliable. Um, if, if you continue to have problems with audio or with the visuals that we can't resolve for you, um, we will be sharing a recording of the webinar with you as well as the slide deck. So you will have a chance to um, watch this again yourself and of course share it with any colleagues that you'd like. Um, just keep an eye on your email tomorrow for details on how to access those materials. Um, if for some reason that email ends up in your spam or junk folder, which does happen from time to time, um, so if you don't get it tomorrow afternoon, um, you can go out to the Pivot Learning website, which is pivotlearning.org, and we'll have posted the materials, the recording, and the slide deck there. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I am pleased to welcome all of our panelists. We're going to start the program today with Robert Curtis, who is Vice President, Education Programs for Pivot Learning. Prior to joining Pivot, Robert was the Director of Regional Support and Assistant Director of Teaching and Learning for Connect Ed, the California Center for College and Career. Robert has extensive experience working nationally with school, district, post-secondary, and workforce leaders building local capacity to transform educational systems and improve student outcomes. He is also a former director of curriculum and instruction for Sonoma Valley Unified School District. Robert is joined today by Dan Stores, who's senior director of K-12 engagement at the Link Learning Alliance. Dan is a career educator who began teaching middle school math and social studies. He went on to become a K-8 school principal and lead the effort to build one of the first blended learning programs in the San Francisco area. Prior to working in education, Dan served on the legislative staff of Senator Barbara Mikulski in Washington, D.C. We are also very excited to have two educators with us from the Critical Design and Gaming School, also known as CDAGS. Patricia Hansen is currently principal at CDAG, so she is in her 12th year as an educator for LAUSD, serving the community of South Central Los Angeles. In 2015, Patricia was identified as one of the top 25 inspirational teachers in Los Angeles by the United Way. We also have Matt, po uh, excuse me, Pebble Varchek with us, who is an instructional coach with CDAGS. Before arriving at CDAGS, he taught English and special education in Baltimore, Chicago, and South Korea. Matt has also served as an instructional coach for the New Teacher Project and content specialist for Teach for America. Uh, and I apologize, Matt, for not pronouncing your name correctly. It's Matt Pivovarczyk. I know we're all looking forward to hearing our panelists, so I'm going to go ahead and turn the program over to Robert to get us started now. Great. Thanks, Emily. So a little bit about Pivot Learning. Uh, Pivot Learning is a nonprofit organization located in Oakland, California. Um, whose mission is a partner with educator design and implement solutions to the greatest challenges in achieving educational justice. Uh, last year, next slide. Uh, last year, Pivot worked with 106 school districts in 17 states, uh, and 50% of the students in Pivot partner districts are low income. Uh, Pivot's also been around for over 25 years. Next slide. Um, so, why the focus on college and career readiness? Well, in 2020, 65% of jobs will require post-secondary education and training, yet in 2018, only 38% 30, of ACT-tested grads met at least three or four college readiness benchmarks. Uh, we see students regularly graduating both our high schools and our colleges not ready for college or career. Uh, next slide. 
And only 11% of business leaders agree that college grads have the skills their business need. And disadvantaged students are, le are less likely to be prepared for college and career, even in high-performing schools and districts. Uh, and we see this in the importance to really engage employers uh, earlier with our students through things like our link learning pathways. Next slide. Uh, when we look at college grads and employers in terms of uh, their preparedness, often students graduating from both high school and from post-secondary institutions feel like they're prepared for uh, what's next, but often there is a, a dissonance between what students think they're ready for and our employers as well as our post-secondary uh, folks. And here you can see around some key competencies where students are feeling like they're prepared, yet when we ask employers, you see a, a disconnect with the employers. So one of the goals of our work with our link learning pathways is to ensure that students are actually prepared for both college and career. And I think you'll uh, see in the CDAX presentation how they're building in uh, these competencies into their program to ensure that happens. Uh, next slide. So, uh, at this point, I want to turn this over to uh, Dan Storch from the link learning, oh, sorry. Uh, so Pivot the First College and Career Readiness, we use a link learning approach and design thinking to engage community of educators, families, workforce, post-secondary other partners. Uh, I think you'll hear from CDAGs how they've really uh, not only engaged uh, this collection of partners, but how they've kept them engaged, uh, not only in the design, but in the implementation and to continue to improve the program. Uh, we also focus on continuous improvement by developing strong cultures where adults and students are learning, developing themselves, and seeing transformative results. And I think the work that CDAGS has done to not only build a strong uh, student culture, uh, but culture for the adults in the system is really uh, one of their keys to success and, and them continuously improving uh, their work. So at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce Dan Storch from the Link Learning Alliance, and he's going to talk a little bit about the link learning principles and elements. So thanks for being with us, Dan. Thank you, Robert. And thanks to Pivot Learning for hosting this webinar. I'm Dan Storrs from the Link Learning Alliance. The mission of the Alliance is to help drive the development and expansion of high quality college and career pathways through the link learning approach. The heart of link learning lies in the and and the power of plus. So if you could go to the next slide. When we combine college and career preparation, we put every student in the position to successfully pursue a full range of college and career options. Historically for young people, education has not been about the and. They faced an or. At some point in their high school experience, they were deemed to be college material or not. So they were encouraged to pursue a college degree or train for a trade. But when integrated, college and career preparation reinforce each other, creating a much stronger equation with real benefits to our students, communities, and economy. In the next slide. Thanks. Uh, link learning is a standard of excellence for college and career preparation. It helps all students benefit through the power of PLUS, and link learning is a demonstrated means for advancing equity in education. So I'd like to pause here and ask you uh, how much you know about link learning coming into this webinar. So you'll see a poll on your screen. If you could uh, take the time to respond to the poll by choosing one, two, or three, and it'll help us get a feel for the group that's here with us today. I'm just gonna pause here for just a, a few seconds for people to uh, kind of give their responses. And then we've got folks voting and we'll give you a few more seconds to get your vote in. All right, Dan, I'm going to share the results. Okay, great. So uh, it looks like, you know, most people here have uh, some knowledge of the basic elements of link learning, which is great. Um, but in whether you do or not, uh, I think there's a lot here today for you to, to really get a broad understanding um, of link learning and how you can kind of further your engagement with it. So let's go ahead and go to uh, the next slide um, on the link learning approach. Um, at the heart of the link learning approach is the integration of four key components. And uh, I don't know if it's possible uh, to go on. To the, 
it yes. is um <laughs> one second i am okay not sure what um why we're not seeing um are you seeing the link learning approach slide uh i'm not but I, I, while you're working on that i can just go okay. ahead and talk about it <laughs> all uh, right sorry about that <laughs> really the, with the link learning approach it's really about four key components and they are one rigorous academics aligned to admissions requirements for state colleges and universities two is career technical education delivering concrete knowledge and skills through a carefully structured sequence of courses third is work-based learning providing students with exposure to the workplace through job shadowing apprenticeships internships and personal interactions with industry professionals uh, and fourth comprehensive support services including counseling and supplemental academic and social emotional supports to provide all students with the opportunity to succeed and there you go you get the little graphic there the to uh <laughs> to go with it um so we're gonna move on now uh to the next slide uh link learning ignites students passions by creating meaningful learning experiences it is based on the reality that students work harder and dream bigger if their education is relevant to them by connecting rigorous academics with real world work experiences young people are introduced to career opportunities they cannot imagine on their own making learning relevant to their lives and inspiring them to succeed in high school and beyond so if we go to the next slide we'll see that in the past 10 years link learning has made incredible strides in making learning relevant for students it began in 2009 in nine school districts we wanted to demonstrate the approach at a systemic level and in urban, rural, and suburban communities. The idea caught fire, and today there are more than 620 link learning pathways across more than 100 school districts in 20 states. Link learning, the reach now involves about 250,000 students, and we're steadily moving toward the day when all young people will have access to high quality college and career pathways. Link learning is expanding because linked learning works. Now go ahead, that's great. The next slide. Let's take a look at the three strands of a high quality link learning pathway. The first is an integrated program of study centered on instructional design that connects rigorous academics and career themed coursework across subject areas. Instructional delivery that features equitable access to interdisciplinary learning opportunities opportunities for students to demonstrate their learning through things like public presentations and completion of a culminating project. Early college credit opportunities, such as dual enrollment, uh, accessible to all students. Post-secondary and industry partners, informing and assessing the program of study. And as much as possible, providing uh, a space where learning takes place in cohorts that facilitate interdisciplinary learning with shared goals for the students. And if we move on to the next strand, work-based learning. Students follow a work-based learning plan informed by input from industry partners and tied to the outcomes defined for their pathway. They have the opportunity to complete multiple experiences ranging from career exploration opportunities to training and career preparation to formal work-based learning through internships and industry certifications. Students self-assess these experiences, connecting them to their academic studies and reflecting on their career skills. Employer and industry partners evaluate the workplace readiness of each student and provide feedback on the quality of their preparation, performance, and professional skills or soft skills. And the third strand, integrated student supports. Students experience learning that emphasizes social awareness, self-management, and a mindset of growth and self-efficacy. The pathway team monitors student academic and personal needs and provides culturally responsive, timely supports and engages families as much as possible. Students learn in a culture of high expectations, are introduced to a variety of post-secondary options and develop individual college and career readiness goals. Students receive guidance and support to help them navigate the college application process in areas like admissions, test taking, and financial aid applications. 
and students gain job application skills and resources they need to prepare to enter the workplace. So there's research to support the efficacy of the link learning approach. Compared with similar peers, students in high quality link learning pathways accumulated nearly nine more credits in high school, were two percentage points less likely to drop out, and were over three percentage points more likely to graduate. These positive findings are particularly strong for students who entered high school with low levels of academic achievement. And this is really important. Linked learning improves equity. For example, compared with similar peers, Latinx students were less likely to drop out and earned 11 more credits. And I think if we go, yeah, if you can go back one, uh, there you go, right there. Uh, ling English language learners were less likely to drop out and also earned over 11 more credits. And African American students earned 15 more credits. If we go to the next slide. The preliminary data from SRI also showed that link learning helps with post secondary transitions. And again, particularly for student groups that are traditionally underrepresented in higher education. On the next slide, we'll see that furthermore, promising outcomes from students enrolled in quality link learning pathways demonstrate that these students are more likely than similar peers to have the skills that future employers need and want. To learn more about what link learning looks like in practice, I have the privilege of turning it over to two amazing dedicated educators from a link learning gold certified pathway. CDAGs at Augustus Hawkins High School in Los Angeles. Matt and Patricia. Hello, um, I'm Matt Pivovarchuk. I'm an instructional coach at the Critical Design and Gaming School. And before that, I was an English teacher here and a special educator. Hi, my name is Patricia Hansen. I'm a, the very proud principal of CDAGs, the Critical Design and Gaming School, and also was a teacher um, first in a link learning school. So um, we're hoping that by sharing our certification experience and our journey uh, with linked learning that you can have a better understanding of what that process is like and also um, how it benefits uh, your program. So I'm gonna hand it over to Trish to kind of give some background about our school. All right, so um, I think we wanted to give you some of the background. Um, one of the things that we think is incredibly important that was just shared right now is about the equity that comes with being a link learning school and ensuring that all students have access to this kind of a rigorous program. Um, so we, when we opened our school eight years ago, we were committed to having a pathway. In fact, we had done some work surveying the surrounding community as our campus was getting built, um, asking them, what are the things, what do you want your school to be like? And what are some of the interests that you have? Um, so one thing that came up over and over again for us, and I'm sure across the universe, was an interest in gaming. Um, and also within Los Angeles is where our infrastructure is building and expanding. There's a larger interest now in STEM and STEAM, particularly around engineering. So that's how we came to our school pathway around critical design and gaming. Now for students, they often first hear gaming and get really excited and think they'll just come here and play games. Parents think they're just gonna come here and play games all day and they get a little concerned as well. So we've had to do a lot of promotion to explain who we are and what they'll um, be able to accomplish as students in our school. So that being said, we are in the heart of South Central Los Angeles. Um, we have a high number of English language learner students. Majority of our students are on free and reduced lunch. Um, we are about 80% Latinx, 13% um, African-American. Um, our school, interestingly enough, is close to 70% male and 30% female, and that's something we're working on to get more of our young women in the community involved in STEAM and STEM. And we also happen to share our campus with two other linked learning schools. So part of when we opened, we wanted students to have that choice. And so what we are seeing is one of our other schools is a health-focused school, the Community Health Advocate School. That's where we're often seeing more females um, selecting that school. So both of us are working to promote, you know, from a gender access lens to change our gender demographics a little bit. But that's currently who we are right now. Um, just other context, we also happen to be in the, we're in a very high um, 
there's a lot of trauma in the community that we're surrounded by um, that makes up who we are. And we share that because we want to be clear that these kind of opportunities do need to be available to all students, no matter where they live, no matter what their zip code is. And all students and stakeholder groups are capable of becoming Gold Link Learning certified schools. So we just give that context, not as a deficit, but just again, as an acknowledgement that regardless of the challenges that we may face with some of the demographics that we're all choosing to serve, this is very possible. And in fact, it's a huge benefit. So we're really proud of that work and we're happy to share it with you guys. And going back to our history with linked learning. So on, on the next slide, you can see um, that last year we achieved gold certification. Mm -hmm. We're very proud of that. And, <laughs> and then uh, the year prior, um, we earned silver certification. And so that happened really quickly and it looks very accelerated. And um, But if you look back at our, our full history of, of working on our pathway and developing our program, there was a lot of work that went into that. And we it was kind of a slow and steady um, uh, move forward in terms of like building our pathway and program. Um, in fact, when we opened in 2012, um, we really even, we, well, we were based in critical, uh, sorry, culture responsive pedagogy and restorative justice. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the year after that, that we really started developing our CTE program and really thinking about linked learning and bringing in elements that would end up being part of our pathway outcomes like design methodology, forming our advisory board. And those are all these elements to the program that we slowly, you know, developed over the next few years, mm -hmm. um, like one piece at a time. Um, but that kind of goes into uh, the next slide, which is the benefit of, of go going through the certification process, um, which um, is that like you can see in those last two years, how much we achieved and how much our, pro our program grew through silver certification and gold certification. And a huge benefit of, of uh, being linked learning certified was the process itself. It really helped us to self-reflect on our program, making sure that we're serving all of our students um, equitably, building out our industry partners in, um, in design and gaming and graphic design, game design, um, engineering, other, other science fields. Um, and it provided just like a, kind of a roadmap to like, what are those elements of a successful program do we need to have to make sure that we're really serving our students well and then providing them the access they deserve to, um, you know, 21st century like skills, right, and, and professional skills and being ready for college. Um, and, and a lot of that work that we did in terms of getting um, certified, uh, it just like it, it provided a, a place for us to celebrate all the work that we had been doing and mm -hmm. the commitments that we had for and the vision that we had for the critical design and gaming school. And so those benchmarks of being silver certified and then gold certified, um, they really helped us move forward. You can see it really accelerated the work in the last two years and we moved pretty quickly. Um, but of course, in addition to all of that, like pursuing link learning certification, it really helped push uh, um, our academics in a more rigorous direction. And it really helped us um, grow a culture of college and career readiness here at CDEX. And I think one thing I would add in as well, I think a challenge most linked learning schools face, um, which we definitely faced, was multiple um, interpretations of what our actual pathway was. So, for example, we had one teacher who was really strong and fully committed to engineering and everything was about engineering. We had other teachers that understood it was just, you know, about playing games. So gamifying their classes. Um, these were all great things, but it was very confusing to our students. And then it also just wasn't clear. So it did sometimes students and staff would say, you know what, I thought we were supposed to feel different. I, like, how do we look different? We're supposed to be a gaming school. So this also really helped us come together as a full staff to be extremely clear on who we are, what are our outcomes, what is our mission and vision, what does our classroom look like in CDAG? So a student who's in CDAGs knows they're in a CDAGs classroom in every classroom, not just three teachers that are bought in and the rest of them just feel like they could be in anywhere, any, any other school, any other place. So I do think that was a huge benefit. It gave us all a lot of clarity. And again, a lot of reason to celebrate. So I think all schools, we often get a little bit bogged down with a lot of accountability um, I don't think anyone's data ever looks like what they want it to look like. And this really gave us a chance to celebrate and be proud of our accomplishments, which then really helps boost the staff and the stakeholders to push forward um, towards even more accomplishment. So it's been a huge benefit for us. 
And then in terms of building our program, one, one asset we had early on was our leadership and culture. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So um, CDAG, we're part of um, Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, and one part of being an LAUSD um, is to, there's an option to become a pilot school. So a pilot school is still a regular community school. There's no wait list. We don't get to select our students. The students who live in our community have the right to come here and they do come here. But what it does mean is there's a little bit more um, focus on the teachers and what they're willing to commit to do. Um, and so that really does emphasize that we're teacher led. And so the teachers choose who their principal is. So they chose me. Um, and I hope they choose me again. No regrets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great. But um, I think the reason why I bring that up is because the teachers, that process allows the teachers to be very activated and requires them to be very activated. Um, so when they, um, I think the resounding theme that we have throughout is having our stakeholders have a voice and a say in where we're going. So where we have the teachers um, committing to doing a college and career readiness course, which happens every day, it's like our homeroom where we have the, the teachers through their elect to work agreement, which is what they sign when they become teachers here. They all commit to doing project-based learning. They all commit to posting our school outcomes in their room. Um, the departments even commit to looking at how they can look at our school outcomes and mission and vision through the lens of their departments. Um, and then also incredibly important for our school culture is having our student voice and being student-centered. So we found it really important to make sure that we had our own student leadership group. They're called the Game Changers, um, but they're a group of students that we really rely on to make sure that our pathway feels real and relevant to the students. Um, and when we think of student voice, we also think about how do we use our projects and other opportunities for them to activate their voices and, and feel a real sense of empowerment to be the Game Changers in the world beyond our school. Um, so each grade level, the students have a major project and the projects are always also connected to the community. So they're not just thinking about how to change, you know, an imaginary place in outer space. They're looking at how can we create a game that's going to improve um, race relations in South Central? How can we create a game that's going to improve college access to students in this neighborhood? How do we create a game to help immigrants find safe harbor once they cross the border? So our students are really engaged that the projects are connected to their actual lived experiences um, to help move and elevate them and also elevate them beyond what their present circumstances are. So that's when we think of being student centered, that's we want our students experiences at the center of the projects and the different work that we're doing, um, but also then connecting them to larger opportunities available in Los Angeles and beyond. And even that picture that you see on the slide, those are our students addressing our advisory board. And our advisory board, are it's the group of um, industry professionals who advise on our curriculum and they work really closely with us um, on our school events and project presentations. And um, they're really invaluable part of our campus community. And it, I would say like, as you're considering linked learning and, and going and ad adopting the, that program, the, um, the, having students involved in that process and really going on that journey with you it was really important for us um so that our students really also understood like what the vision was of our school um mm -hmm. as well as the teachers in terms of like all being centered and together on um building a really excellent um industry pathway mm -hmm. and one thing i'd add to when we do the grade level project presentations that means that 100 percent of cdag students at some point every single year are having a conversation and presenting their expertise to real life experts so we bring in you know members of the um of the our pathway so there's game designers local engineers um different people working in the department of water and power are on the panels where the students are presenting their projects so that really does it's very clear it's student voice um and it's regardless if they have an iep if they're special ed if they um, just came to the country in the last two months, regardless of what their language level is, the accommodations and the supports are there so that every single student gets that opportunity. So it's a very important part of our program. Well, speaking of student support, I believe that's the next slide. Uh -huh. Yes, there we go, <laughs> supportive environment. Um, yeah, so it, there's often a misconception about link learning and, and a focus on the, the CTE, the career and technical education aspect of it. and that's definitely a very important part um, of our program 
Um, and it, you know, our students get those technical skills and it's amazing, we love it. Um, but it's equally important that we're building a really supportive um, environment in order to facilitate the kind of community we want to build and the academic achievement um, that our students deserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're um, you know very committed to restorative justice pro practices um, because also we we all recognize and I'm sure everybody on this webinar um, would hope to work with other people that are are skilled in communicating and on building relationships and then having um, a, a, a some sense of social emotional needs in terms of interacting. So. We use these practices not just because we need them based off of some of our students' experiences, but really because we want to make um, ensure that they know how to be good group members, that they know how to interact properly during project time when things are intense and everyone's stressed out. How do you make sure to stay productive? So those practices, the restorative practices, are not just something we do you know, in the morning in homeroom and it doesn't fill us, you know, follow the rest of the day. It's a really important part in all of our classes. Um, we also, we've invested in having other academic supports, you know, we have two academic counselors who are all, the counseling team is very bought into our pathway, uh, which I do think is very important because I think some of the traditional training for some counselors, um, the pathway classes are often viewed as just an elective that's not necessary, where we're 100% bought in together that a student taking the game design class in 10th grade is just as important as them taking their PE credit. You know, and if, if the student, you know, failed a class and they have to make it up somehow, we have very clear conversations about what class they should miss. Because again, we don't want the only students having access to our pathway classes, the only kids that are on track to graduate that aren't in English language support classes, that aren't in their um, SPED pullout class. So that's been very important to have the counselors on board with our programming as well. So then in terms of thinking about other elements that um, we were focusing on developing as we pursued link learning certification, um, on the next slide, it, it'll show you there, there were a series of instructional shifts we had to make in order to really um, incorporate gaming and design into our curriculum and then provide students access to um, authentic industry experiences and work-based learning experiences. Um, and so that work started um, with uh, if, if you see on the next slide, the creating measurable pathway outcomes. And so early on, we had put these down, like I think in our second year to start <laughs> the, the process. And we realized like after a couple of years of working with them that we, while well, we, because these were actually collaboratively designed with um, our industry partners in, in the gaming industry. And so, you know, they let us know that like, well, if you're designing gaming school, like a key part of that would be having students, you want, want them by the end of, their four years with you, um, they would ideally have a firm grasp of design methodology. They would bounce back from failure. We call that gamer mindset. Most people would know that it's growth mindset. Um, and then also from a computer science perspective, um, being fluent in systems thinking when they're problem solving, but also question finding. Um, that's really important too to our, our message of critical design and gaming, because that's another important element to our school, which is kind of as Trish mentioned earlier, we're not just designers and designing games for entertainment. Um, they're to entertain, sure, but they're also to to do good. They're, 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 they exist to change the world, right? And to do that, we have to break down systems and figure out what do people need? Um, what are they not getting? And of course, teamwork and communication and then college and career readiness. So over those years of like the pathway outcomes, we revised them a couple of times. And then, um, the, the, that picture here, but then we had we created rubrics for those pathway outcomes. Um, and then again, just to be clear, like our pathway outcomes are the the skills that our students, we want our students to graduate with, you know, as they leave CDAG. So over their four years, these are the kind of the graduate profile. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that teachers could use as a resource um, to make sure that when they're assessing student work or bringing the pathway into their uh, classrooms, that they have some stuff to focus on in terms of how do I make this relevant to our industry theme. So building off of that, uh, to the next slide, um, in terms of how those pathway outcomes are um, developed and assessed, um, there should be a next slide on us, our projects. So um, we practice interdisciplinary project-based learning at CDAGS. And so it's, it's project-based learning, but it's also between grade levels. 
um, sorry, between different content areas for each grade level. And again, when these, the heart of these projects are um, how are students able to, yes, learn, learn what they're learning in their classes for that grade level, but also grow in, in our pathway outcomes and demonstrate mastery of those outcomes. Um, and we started really slow with this. So like we did like one year at a time because it, it was just, it, it's a lot of work and focus designing the sort of curriculum, but then also building an industry support and industry partners were so key in even developing these projects in the first place. Like I, I, I'll say like I, I was on the grade developing the 10th grade project and um, you know, it, it involved, I was an English teacher for that project and it involved students writing um, their game in my class, which is building into narrative writing standards and then taking that narrative and bring it to their game design class to make a story for their game. Um, but I had never had any practical experience writing, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, writing game narrative. So um, fortunately, because of our, of our network, I was able to reach out to a professional game writer and they advised on the curriculum, helped us build it out, and then were key to assessing the student work. And it's these interdisciplinary projects that really provide a lot of the authenticity and practice that our students um, have in our industry theme. Um, and all these are authentically uh, assessed. So as you can see, that's, that's one of our ninth grade students presenting before a couple of our um, industry partners, an architect and a game designer. Um, their, their project for, that's a ninth grader presenting their PSA um, for, that they did in Scratch. They programmed that um, to uh, address an environmental need in their community. Um, so yeah, so in terms of those projects are key to assessing pathway outcomes and building student um, mastery. However, that for us it was a slow process of building that in. We did it, it seems like a lot looking at it, but it was it was really one grade level at a time, one year at a time practically. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the next slide, another instructional shift for us was building out a senior portfolio defense. So I, this is maybe my favorite part of our program, which is that. At the, um, the culminating um, activity as a senior, over the four years, they're building a portfolio because they're professional designers, right? They want to sh they need to sh have a place to show their work. So the, our students do a digital portfolio. Um, they build a website for their work, and they present that, defend their work be um, before a board, uh, a panel rather, of industry professionals, teachers, um, and they explain like, you know, this is what I learned over my time here at CAGS. Here are the pathway outcomes I mastered here's what I do differently and here's where I'm going with my future. And it's a really amazing experience for the students because it really celebrates all the work that they've done over the, the, their time here at CDAGS. Um, and it's, you know, it's important again to, for this to be an equitable experience for all of our students. So um, we make sure that we accommodate all of our um, English learners and our students with IEPs, um, all the accommodations that they would receive in any assessment are offered for their senior portfolio defense. And again, like the, the portfolio defense can seem like a lot at first as you're looking at like, how do I incorporate this into the program? But I would say like, this is really like, I mean, it's, it's such an amazing experience to close off the year and close off the seniors time at, a, at high school with all that reflection and looking forward. Um, that's really powerful and, and celebratory. I think what I would add to what I think is so powerful and critical about this and also all the projects is we're giving, the students are able to articulate these huge things that they've accomplished that then when they can go into an interview when they ask oh what kind of skills do you bring you know there's usually such a generic answer to that but our students are able to say oh I have a gamer mindset I'm a systems thinker so we're already giving them that opportunity and, and equipping them with some of that language um, that's really going to support them in larger out of you know out of school experiences whether it's an interview whether it's going up negotiating a car lease whether it's negotiating a a raise and we really want our kids to and we're very clear with them about that how do you use evidence to justify what you deserve and how do you articulate that to different types of audiences so we think it's a really huge part of our preparation for them as they're leaving high school and then um, so the next slide um, in terms of another element of our of our program was is the program of study itself so as um, you may be considering like you know um, looking at link learning or, or pursuing the certification process. Um, for Silver, we had to have our program of study in place. Although I will say like every year, like we change our program of study and grow it because we really are trying to build uh, as relevant a pathway as possible for what 
um, our students need to, to have in terms of technical knowledge and professional skills in our industry pathway. And so even this past year, we changed some of the courses in our program of study based on student feedback and then and mm -hmm. also to align um, our coursework more closely to our information communication technology pathway. So it's, it's always a work in progress, but it's, it's, it's a really, you know, you want to build up that program study not to, of course, the CT sequence, but also how are we incorporating the industry theme into all the curriculum for all the classes? Because that really makes the learning come alive and it's relevant and it makes the whole program cohesive for the student. Mm -hmm. um, and then thinking about college, what opportunities for um, early college credit attainment are there? So like, you know, we offer dual enrollment for an app certification with West LA College. That was a, a relationship that we built. Um, and then of course, like offering as many AP courses as we can with our staff, mm -hmm. really gives students a leg up when they're applying to college. And we've, tried, we've worked really hard to also align our AP course offerings to our pathway as well. Um, so again, we're a, a STEAM focused school, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, so we've worked to, you know, we have teachers who don't have experience teaching AP calculus before willing to step up to make sure we offer that. So we have now AP chemistry, AP computer science principles, AP computer science programming, um, and AP Calculus as well. So we found that was really important too, because at one point we had a lot of our, all of our AP offerings were basically humanities classes. So we had government, um, English and Spanish AP classes, which are great and which we still offer, but we wanted to make sure that we were also aligning those college experiences to our pathway. And again, those are some of those little things where we're making sure that our pathway runs through everything that we do and it's clear. So in addition to those academic and curricular shifts, we also have our, our work-based learning opportunities and ways mm -hmm. that our students interface directly with industry and industry partners. Um, and so there it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there's a range of work-based learning experiences that our students experience from field trips to Indicate every year, which is the largest independent gaming festival. Um, career preparation through you know mock interview practice and their career day exploring those those and we have a partnership with Nickelodeon and on and on and and, and the, that can seem overwhelming like if I saw this I think at first I was like how did how does that even happen like how does a high school staff interface with an industry and get buy in there um it was a process and it, I think stepping back like it just we started small so you know, reaching out to people. People are incredibly generous with their time. I'm always so like amazed at when they reach out to graphic designers and game designers and engineers, like how much they really want to meet our students and work with them. Mm -hmm. And then just starting small with like, hey, come and come and visit our students and see what they're working on. Maybe they're a guest speaker, you know, and then you start building a relationship. They might end up, you know, coming back and thinking of ways that might email you like, oh, you know, I think we could do this with our company, with your school. And it, things start to snowball from there. I'll give one example with our, um, I think maybe our, our most, um, one of the relationships I feel like really benefit our, benefited our students the most and really proud of mm -hmm. is our designer in residence, which is kind of, you know, it's a unique role at a yeah. high school. Um, we have a professional designer who is, is with us. We have uh, an MOU with, mm -hmm. um, and she's building out our makerspace, which is, we call it the imagination lab because it's all digital and emerging technology. So like, 3D printers, software for design, animation, um, VR equipment, really looking forward into like what, what's next in terms of design and gaming. And she's an amazing person. And that's like, and through her, we now have internship classes, students intern with her design studio. It's phenomenal. Classes can push into that space and use all that tech and connect to their English class or their math class or um, their history class. And it's a phenomenal resource and she's an amazing person, but that started really small. It was like a four year process of like meeting her at a conference. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? To, um, hey, you should stop by the school and meet our students. And, and she did. And then she fell in love with the students and she started an after school program. And so when you're thinking about like career exposure and building those partnerships, it's it really makes the program come alive for students. And I would just say, you know, thinking about that to start small. Mm -hmm. I think too, a critical part about um, our, work with um with her is that um our, our teachers were all programmed or not programmed well i guess programmed but they all their programs of study were all around education 
right? We don't have a lot of people with a background in game design, engineering, development. Regardless what your pathway is, generally that's not the expertise or training that your teachers um, experienced, right? So for us, she's able to provide that training for our teachers and consult with them, right? So our English teacher was reading the book, Blood and Bone, um, and said, I wanna do some kind of a design project, but I can't think of something. So she's able to be the thought partner and together they came up with a project that incorporates design that's elevating students' understanding of that novel that they're reading. Um, I also just wanna highlight, again, we're um, in a community and you know, raise your hands if you're like us where you're not surrounded by startup game designers <laughs> and tech yeah, that's companies. Been a real, it's a challenge. Yeah, so you know, Google headquarters is in Los Angeles, but it's an hour bus ride on a bus that we chartered. So two hour, mm -hmm. you know, if you're taking public transportation. So we struggled with finding our students internships that could happen during the day. We're always offered them, but you know, our students needed them during the day because it's hard for them to do it on the weekends. They work, they have a lot of responsibilities with their families. So because we weren't able to have them in the surrounding community, we built it into our campus. So again, seventh period is our internship class and they're working with um, our designer and residents and it's ran as a design firm where those kids come in there, open the binder, sign their time card and they're in the work zone. So I wanted to share that as a practice. It just sort of evolved here, but when we started talking about it with some other people, they were really appreciative of it. And again, I started as a teacher on this campus and I actually started in our, our sister school, which is the Community Health Advocate School. When I ran the internship program in the health school, I, it was easier for me to build connections with our local clinics, um, our local mental health providers to secure those internships that are within a two mile radius of the school. But when you have a, a the, Link learning pathway isn't as accessible in your surrounding community. We really encourage that practice of trying to bring it in um, into the school day and onto your campus somehow. We'd be happy to share more about that with anybody if they, you know, need support talking through it. And then the thing too is that gold is not the end of the journey. Um, so we achieved gold and we're super proud of that, but there's still so much growth. You know, kind of as Tris men mentioned, we're still working on creating more internship opportunities for our students and talking to our partners about how can we maybe do some more like remote internships um, and adding more college credit attainment opportunities uh, for post-secondary. And then, you know, one thing that we're really looking forward to is as we're growing our pathway, like the our neighboring middle and elementary schools are really taking notice and they want, you know, to plug in and we want to be a hub for um st like you know steam uh, um in south la mm -hmm. and and so like that's one thing that we're working on is basically trying to really pull in all of our uh, um neighboring middle and elementary schools um so they can really use all of these these resources that we have to to benefit the entire community mm -hmm. um so it is it is you know always a work in progress um and yeah that's that's basically <laughs> our whole pathway in a nutshell it's yeah. a, Thanks for listening to us. Yes. <laughs> we're very proud of our school. Um, and, and, and it's been a, a long process and we still have a long way to go, but Link Learning has really helped, you know, focus our work. And um, I would say too, like, you know, in terms of looking at like how Link Learning and certification and pursuing Link Learning has, has really impacted our school, like I would say even just like our, our school culture, like as we've really focused on our pathway and make, made sure that um, our our theme is present in all of our classes and the projects the students do are really relevant and interesting and that the work that they get to express is authentic. Um, we've seen a shift in, yes, academics and rigor and students are, are doing well, but you know, there's, 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 the, there's that academic achievement and growth, but maybe more importantly for me is like there's this, students really are seeing themselves as designers. They're seeing themselves as you know, game designers, artists, scientists, and when they're looking at their future, like they're really looking at, I, I what, where can I go to college? Um, I want to study computer science. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes they, they they go through a program and they're like, I've had a lot of computer science experience and I don't want to do that. But yeah. then you know that they've ruled one thing out, you know? <laughs> so it's, I, I really see students being more prepared going into their future because they've had a lot of opportunities to really hone the professional skills. That's that's one thing I think has really benefited our program in terms of like working with link learning and using the certification process to um, really improve our school. Absolutely, and one last thing I would add too is I think um, something that's been important for us that we've been trying to is making sure that all of our stakeholders are proud of and excited and understand what it means to be gold link learning certified. 
so we do promote it a lot now like i have it on a little gold certification on our you know weekly communications and also just at our most recent back to school night um last month we had a photo booth set up where we had little gold shining stuff in the background because it gave us an opportunity to explain to the parents of the students that we are gold certified what does that mean and you could even see more of a sense of pride of those parents being excited that their child's going to a gold certified school um and so again it's it's the process has been great and it's just it's created a lot of momentum for us and i think again the most important thing was this sense of pride and morale um for all of our stakeholders students staff um and our parents and community so we're very um, happy to share and support anybody that's trying to go through the process we would love to share more about our journey but that's all for now <laughs> <laughs> thank great. you that was fantastic well uh, matt and patricia this is uh, robert thanks so much for joining us today and uh, Dan and I had the privilege of working with uh, the CDAG team last year on their gold certification, and we were just so impressed with just how they approached the process and the work they had done. And uh, I know Dan and I left inspired. And uh, when we were there, we for the certification visit, the site visit, it was really a community celebration. And we were there. It wasn't just the teachers or the administration talking about the program, what they achieved. They had their parents and their teachers and students and the whole community. Uh, and it was really a community celebration and uh, you could just feel the pride the community had in the school and the program. So um, just really thank you for your generosity of just sharing your time and what you've learned today. And just how you approach this as, a, as really continuing to improve and learn and your commitment to your students and your community. And it's been a, been a privilege to work with you all the last year. Um, at this point, I just want to briefly um, talk through certification and open this up to some questions. So. Um, as Pat and uh, Patricia and Matt uh, talked about, uh, link link certification really is a process that demonstrates kind of excellence in these key elements. Uh, next slide. And there's three uh, three levels. There's candidate, which is really just uh, showing that you have the core elements in place. Silver is that you know, you've got this foundation built and you're beginning to use data to strengthen the pathways. And then gold certification is the evidence of positive impact for students and um, i think you got to hear some of that in in the work that matt and patricia and their team at cdax has, has done uh, next slide uh, there's over 600 registered pathways and you can see that we have 250 candidate 107 silver and 12 gold pathways cdax being one of those 12. next slide so how to begin, uh, I think the first thing you heard this from um, both Matt and Patricia is identify a strong uh, design team or planning team or leadership team and engage your stakeholders early and often and keep them engaged. Uh, I think that's really critical and you could uh, hear how important they've been and the whole community has been in uh, really the CDAG program. Uh, you can also conduct a self-study. We've got a self-study tool and some other resources you can use to get started to identify uh, assets and what your strengths are and also to figure out where you want to grow and improve and then really just stepping into the implementation and taking it one step at a time uh, to move forward. Um, so we're excited uh, about the link learning certification. We've just relaunched it. I've been working with the Alliance for a number of years now on certification and uh, look forward to uh, seeing this work move forward. So uh, next slide, I think that might be it. And this is just a quick example of the link learning self-study tool that we'll be sending out um, after the webinar. So I'll turn this back over to Emily for questions. Great, thank you, Robert. And um, yes, thank you, Matt and Patricia for um, giving us a in-depth look at what you're doing or a sort of an in-depth look at what you're doing at CDAGS um, and Dan for um, providing us um, information about the link learning certification. Um, before we get to the questions for the panelists, and we do have some that have come in, um, I just want to remind you that you'll get a copy of the slide deck and the recording. These will be sent to you by email tomorrow, and they'll also be posted to the Pivot Learning website, which is um, pivotlearning.org. Um, you can also learn more about um, Pivots Beyond High School program, uh, which is a program that partners with uh, districts and schools to help implement the principles of linked learning and continuous improvement. Um, so do check out pivotlearning.org for more information about that and we will send you a link in the follow-up email as well. All right, so let's go ahead and um, get to some of our questions. Um, so the first is, um, what's the typical timeline from candidate to silver to gold? Um, is it typically rather rapid, like CDAG showed, or what's um, what's the general pathway for that? 
So do you want, I don't know who you want to. Uh, Dan, you know, I think you, you can, yep, you can yeah, get you take, information. You take, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I would just say, I, I guess it depends on your, you know, definition of rapid. I, I think um, that uh, Matt did a good job of describing what a process it was and you start with some small steps and uh, and move on from there. Um, so I think, you know, I hate to, uh, personally, you guys can jump in, but I, I hate to put a an exact timeline on it. I, I think, you know, getting to the point of building a program where you have sort of a silver level program with the pro programmatic things in place can at least easily take a couple of years, um, if not more. And then, you know, once that established, really focusing on the depth of your program and um, and getting those student outcomes that you want, which again can take, you know, a few more years, two, three, four, whatever, whatever it takes to to make that happen. Um, I don't know if Robert or or Matt or Trish, if you have something. Yeah, I, I think like looking at like so in terms of our process, like it looks like it. So it was back to back silver and then gold. But the reason that happened, I think, is is partially because if you look at the whole timeline, like that was five years of building towards silver, even mm -hmm. um, looking at those rubrics. And I think, you know, honestly, we weren't even looking that closely at the gold rubric when we were doing a lot of that work mm -hmm. previously. Like it, we we were a little late to like using the rubrics to guide our pathway construction, which was a mistake on our part. So don't repeat that mistake. Um, <laughs> Because they really do help a lot in terms of like focus and where where should you focus your your efforts um, and and yeah so like once we started looking at that we're like oh the stuff that we've been building all those years actually puts us more into gold territory so we kind of over planned over a series of five years that kind of gave us a little bit of an edge in terms of more quickly um, going for for silver and then gold but I would say if we didn't have that stuff in place going into silver it would have been more time um going deeper like dan said into our pathway to be ready for gold yeah i, I would just add it just depends on what, what you have in place so i think it really depends on where your starting point is and uh really being thoughtful about uh, how you engage key stakeholders as well and taking that time to to do that right at the front end of the board great i think that was helpful and i know those self-study tools will be helpful for folks as well to get um start figuring out what they have and what they need to do to get from candidate to silver to gold. Um, so uh, Matt and Patricia, question for you. Um, can students start in one pathway school, say they start in CDAG, decide that they're not interested in that and want to move to a different career pathway school? Is Can they do that within their four years or once they start, they need to go through with what they've chosen? Well, um, so our we are we're on a shared campus and we're it's three small schools together um so it's not i know that there's some campuses with multiple like a the school has multiple pathways um ours is you know our small school has the one pathway so however every we will have some students that we had a young lady that was very committed was just like look i know i want to be a nurse um i love this stuff but i really want to do that you know, the family has just like they would have an opportunity at any school, you know, to follow whatever district process and protocol there is um, to, you know, go to a different school. Um, and for us, it's just different because it's like literally down the hallway on our campus. Um, but we find we don't have that that often. There's maybe one kid per year that I can honestly think of that wants to leave, even though we have seniors when they're graduating say, my next step, I plan to, you know, be, I want to be a psychologist. I want to be a therapist. Um, I want to be um, a teacher. So a lot of the students, they love our pathway and they fully engage in it. And it is some of our most activated students that we find later on decide that, you know, they're not here just to become a engineer or a, or a computer scientist, but they, the pathway still engages them. And I think that they trust that this process is going to equip them better for college and career. So we don't generally, it's not a major thing that we deal mm -hmm. with, I'd say. Um, so I don't have a clear answer on that. <laughs> yeah, because because our, our whole school is the pathway. So because we're a small school on its own with its own principal. Mm -hmm. So if they wanted to go to one of our sister schools that shared our campus, they would, you know, 
leave our school and then join that school. Mm -hmm. They have to enroll. The one thing I'd add is, I mean, all of our kids are on path for like their A through G. <clears throat> they all have A through G courses, you know, everything. We have a seven period um, schedule. So that also allows us to have some of the additional electives. But again, our teachers embed our pathway regardless through the A through G classes. So if a student does need to change or if a student wants to join our school, which we've had that happen, quite that happens quite often, um, you know, they're able to kind of slide right in. It's not, you don't have to start as a ninth grader in order to be successful here. We figure out ways to add people in, you know, throughout the four years. Great. Well, thank you. And unfortunately, we have reached the end of our time. I'm going to slip one last question in um, for you, Dan and Robert. Um, is there a way to know if there's a link learning school near um, where someone is? Is there a list available somewhere? Dan, yeah, well, I'll leave that to you. Yeah, uh, we'd be happy to do that if you um, would just, first of all, there's there's a couple of different ways. Um, you could contact me uh, directly. Um, it, you can find it at the linklearning.org website or, or email me at dan at linklearning.org. And I could kind of find out a little bit more about your interest and where you are to kind of match you up and happy to match you up with someone who could be helpful. Additionally, you could go um, to a website um, called Data Mart, and again, you can email me and I can hook you up with that, where you can just do searches of link learning um, pathways um, by industry, by location. So, and we, can, um, and we can send some of that out also in the follow up email. So, we can send out some of that information with some of the links for folks as well. So, we'll, we'll do that in the follow up for sure. Yeah, Great. absolutely. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us and for the questions that came in. And thank you, um, Dan, Robert, Matt, and Patricia, for taking your time to share all of this with us today. It has been extremely interesting, and I know folks are going to have a lot to think on and move forward with um, following this webinar. So one final reminder um, that you will get the PowerPoint in the recording. And again, feel free to share those with colleagues. Um, this may be um, a good point of discussion as you start to think about how you might integrate um, link learning into your schools and districts. Um, I also want to invite you to join us on October 16th um, for another webinar. It will also be at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, this time we'll be joined by Oceanside High School and they're going to share their experience um, with implementing linked learning. They're now in their second year. Um, they've been planning for a while, but now are officially in their second year of um, having career pathways available to their students and implementing project-based learning and much more. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Um, we will include a link to register for that webinar in the email that you'll receive tomorrow. And finally, when you log off, you will be prompted to take a short feedback survey. Um, we'd really appreciate your answering the five questions. Um, they're very quick and they help us um, improve our webinars and also give you an opportunity um, to provide some ideas for webinars that would be interesting and helpful to you. So thank you again for joining us and thanks to all of our panelists. I hope everybody has a great afternoon or evening depending on where you are and um, we hope to have you on our next webinar October 16th.